Good morning and welcome to the new season, fall season of Connecting Bridges and Borders at the Institute for Dispute Resolution located at New Jersey City University. Uh, part of our first season today is going to be on alternative dispute resolution and we are taking it from the prism of our New Jersey uh, audience but looking outward as always from a global context and we have a really amazing speaker uh, that will be uh, speaking on the topic of ADR, uh, what we also call alternative dispute resolution, and providing some interesting observations, both historically, uh, currently, and where some innovations as well as case law uh, are taking us. And we're gonna sort of look at it from the, from the perspective of New Jersey. Uh, and because of that, we have one of these really more seasoned architects that has a great memory data of what ADR has grown to become in our state. Uh, today we have Bob Margulies, and I wanna welcome them to the show. Bob, how are you today? I'm peachy keen, how are you? I'm doing well. So Bob, you, you wear many hats within the legal community as well as your activism and support, uh, teaching students, teaching professionals. Uh, you've certainly been uh doing this for 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 many many years and we'd love to get some of your insight uh historically where adr started in our state and uh maybe you could take us through a little bit of a of a pattern of going from the past to the present and some interesting insight that we can all take away from today's show well david uh, i'm sort of an accidental mediator in 1995 which uh is more than a couple of weeks ago <laughs> it seems now, um, the court decided to, they had a program, it was like the field of dreams, nobody came. And so they decided to train three lawyers uh, in the 21 counties, so 63 of us, as mediators. And I, just by happenstance, was one of them. And I got excited about it. I got involved and in on a, a Supreme Court committee, which makes our rules, recommends our rules that the Supreme Court enacts. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I designed the uh, the civil uh, commercial uh, mediation system uh, for the court system. And over the years, we created courses. So we'd have a cadre. Uh, we've uh, created professional organizations. Uh, but what we've done that's been really uh, terrific is we have changed the culture. When I was a young lawyer, if you wanted to negotiate, you negotiated with your adversary. Now, if you want to negotiate, <laughs> someone says, uh, we need a mediator. Well, I'm a mediator, so that's fine. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they don't know how to negotiate anymore without uh, a third party neutral facilitator. And so uh, I'm pretty excited about how that's changed. When you talk about this change, if I could, I know you are well aware of Roscoe Pound and that historical context around what happened many years ago. Where do you see, and maybe you can educate our audience a little bit on who Roscoe Pound was and why it was important and impactful in, in, in the mediation yeah. culture. A little over years 40 ago, um, at the request of the um, uh, <clears throat> Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, a Harvard held what was called the Pound Conference, named after the Roscoe Pound. Uh, at which a Harvard professor, Frank Sander, came up with a concept of the multi-door courthouse. And what it was, was if you go into a court, <clears throat> you should be able to decide the fuss meeting the forum. Uh, do I want an arbitration? Do I want a uh, jury trial? Do I want a non-jury trial? Uh, do I want a mediation? Uh, you know, how do I want to solve my problem? And the wave started in California, came across the country, uh, it turned out that Justice Garibaldi, first woman Supreme Court Justice on our court, uh, was at that Pound Conference and she brought that concept to New Jersey. Uh, and as a result of that, we named, uh, we created a, uh, uh, the Garibaldi Inn of Court, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, fashioned after the English Inns of Court, it's a mentoring society of, of uh, lawyers. And we were the first ones to do that on alternative dispute resolution in the country. And you know, you talk about in your opening words about changing the culture. 
So, so let's sort of look at that linear perspective of Justice uh, Garibaldi and her legacy. What happened uh, in that beginning of that process as it became introduced into the legal community, the judiciary community, uh, in those early years, and and perhaps you can give some insight on that as we sort of develop out the, the dis discussion into the present day. Well, as a result of designing this program, uh, what we did is we went out and picked four pilot counties, four out of the 21, and we sold the court on trying mediation. It turns out that most cases resolve in this country, 95% or more, New Jersey's 98.8%, of all superior court, so the, the higher court cases are resolved or dismissed under any circumstance. So the question is, how do you get there? And what we, we've learned is that mediation uh, is a, a really good place to get there. Now, in the beginning, it was very difficult. Lawyers did not understand it. Uh, they were resistant to it. But once they touched it and felt it and saw it work, uh, uh, they became reliant upon it. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, today, uh, if someone wants to, to solve a case or if they're in the court system and in, in uh, uh, certain of the case types, uh, they're pushed into mediation, so they have to try it. And we find very high resolution rates as a result of it. So you bring up this idea that they touched mediation. Maybe you can explain a little further, what is the experience and why does mediation work and is a good alternative to traditional litigation or other forms of private right of action such as arbitration? Well, uh, arbitration is merely private judging. So it's, it's picking, instead of having a uh, judge with a robe, you pick uh, either the lawyer or retired judge someone who has experience in an area and has confidence in the parties in order to tell you what the answer is. The, the thing about mediation is it's consensual. In other words, it's you deciding how you're going to resolve your problem, what you're willing to do as opposed to it being imposed upon you. And that gives you so much more flexibility in resolving a problem. Uh, one of the things, for instance, uh, it does is you have a commercial uh, uh, dispute, in, instead of <clears throat> walking away happy or sad, you may end up saving the relationship and continuing uh, with safeguards, for instance, uh, going forward. Uh, so it, it gives parties the alternative to walk away uh, uh, where they are satisfied in the result much more than they would be if they uh, won or lost in, in an adversarial contest. The other thing is judges, some judges are good settlers. Judges don't have the time to spend. The process is, a, the mediation process is a process and it seems to take some time for parties to do what? To readjust their expectation. Everybody wants it their way until they figure out, well, if I can't have it my way, how can I resolve this problem? Uh, with a readjusted expectation so I can move on with my life. So over over the last, you know, probably 20 years that mediation has been developing in the state of New Jersey, through the court system, through the private, you know, legal system itself, through contract uh, uh, processes, um, what are you seeing that has been the best outcomes and what are you seeing that still needs some work? Well, the, the ones that I get most excited about are the ones that are high conflict or emotional. For instance, uh, uh, probate matters. Uh, I had a judge the other day tell me uh, it's one of the areas where everybody fights over somebody else's money, uh, uh, but they become very emotional. It has been very successful in divorce cases. Uh, it's been very successful in um, high context commercial matters where there's confidentiality, particularly where there's confidentiality involved, uh, uh, because it is a confidential uh, process. So, uh, I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's, I, I still litigate, I still uh, perform work as a lawyer representing clients in litigation, uh, but to the extent that I can get those matters into mediation, I find that clients are much more satisfied 
uh, than going through the, uh, the expense because the expense of a trial, it's not just a monetary expense, it's an emotional expense. It, it diverts you from whatever you otherwise do productively. Uh, so I, uh, and what we have done in New Jersey, a little different than almost every place in the country is we have early mediation. We, <clears throat> we, we allow and encourage the parties to exchange focused information in order so they can make an informed and voluntary settlement decision. But we try to do it earlier uh, to give them the opportunity to save the money uh, uh, of the transactional costs of, uh, of a lawsuit. And we're seeing improvement in the traditional parts of mediation um, today. And, and we can certainly sort of have a separate uh, follow-up question on online mediation, but really in the traditional sense of coming together for these mediation sessions. Where do you see improvement? And also, where, where, where do you see the courts um, treating mediation these days, especially when it comes to some of the cases that come down from challenges to arbitration hearings? Well, let's take um, uh, the, the, the place that I see the most opportunity is in the areas that we have not utilized mediation before, such as uh, medical malpractice. And there's some particular problems in that area because there's a national list that if you settle a case over 35 case over $35,000, your name goes on the list. There are consents to insurance uh, decisions that you don't have in the commercial world. Uh, so there's some particular problems you have to deal with, but that would be one area that I think would be very helpful uh, to, uh, for the courts to embrace. The other area is in the what we call the tort area, so if uh, the negligence area. And I, I think there, there's an opportunity there to bring those people to the table uh, you know, much earlier and, and uh, frankly save, uh, save an awful lot of money, uh, both for the insurers and for the claimants. What's happened both in the United States Supreme Court and in the New Jersey Supreme Court is a disproportionate number of cases are now being uh, um, considered relating to arbitration. And it's uh, as a result of about three or four or five years ago, a number of articles in the New York Times uh, that was very critical, particularly in the employment area, because a disparity of bargaining power being asserted. Uh, arbitration has gotten a bad name uh, uh, out in the public. And so one of the things that we have to think about is how can we utilize arbitration? Because it, where, you, where you can't mediate, where you can't resolve things, um, uh, it, it, is a, it is the worldwide go-to uh, because you cannot enforce a, uh, uh, an order in another country. We only have comedy. We don't have uh, full, forth, uh, uh, full faith and credit as we do in the United States. Uh, we find that arbitration worldwide is the preferred mode. The other thing is, in India, it's 25 years to get a result. In Brazil, I think it's, it's 20 years to get a result in court. So, uh, you know, but justice delayed is justice denied. It's taken to an extreme without some of these other uh, modalities being available. And, and how, and for New Jersey, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of places uh, both here and abroad uh, use or exploring or considering what they call a court-mandated mediation program. And in New Jersey, I, I believe it's called Rule 140. Can you just explain to our audience how this works and, and what the benefits are to that process? Well, in Europe, we have, the, of course, the European Directive uh, uh, in the European community. But uh, here, what, what our court rule is, is in a certain number of case types, about 13 case types, uh, 90 days after the first answer is filed to the complaint, you are assigned to mediation, you can pick your own mediator, or if not, you know, David Weiss will be your mediator who's on an approved roster, uh, who's taken a course, uh, and who has experience uh, to be the neutral to help you solve your case, uh, and gives you the opportunity uh, during the lawsuit when you are ready, when the parties have enough information, being helped through the process by the mediator, uh, come together, Today, of course, with COVID, we come together uh, a combination of ways. We come together on Zoom. I've had them, some of the parties here and some on Zoom. And uh, some people, uh, we have a large office 
uh, and we can keep separated. So some people want to come to the office and have a mediation. So we're, we're very mediators, among other things, claim to be uh, two things, patient and flexible. And we, uh, maybe not in our family lives, but uh, certainly as mediators, we, we practice that. So when you talk about the patience and flexibility, do you see room for mediation within our elementary and high school systems, our communities? Um, you know, today we're, we face a lot of challenges. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure every decade has faced their own unique challenges, but COVID has sort of presented a, a global wide challenge with a lot of different uh, conflicts, disputes, polarizations, things that are really morphing every day. Where do you see mediation playing a role in the educational field, uh, especially maybe in the beginning of the process of education in general conflict resolution training or courses at a young age? Very frankly, a, a lot of mediation in this country came out of community mediation projects. And from those, we, uh, there are a number of people that have gone out into the schools. Uh, and for instance, a, a big problem in schools is bullying. A big problem online among young people is bullying. The peer pressure of uh, young people, uh, you know, on the internet is, and I've had, I've actually uh, uh, tried a case of a young woman who was uh, 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 accused of bullying, uh, it was juvenile, uh, and, and it was a criminal trial, uh, accused of bullying. So th the idea of being able to go out uh, and teach mediation techniques to young people to diffuse uh, uh, bullying and to diffuse uh, conflict, uh, not only among students, but between students and teachers. Uh, and this is particularly so in the urban areas where culture uh, may be different than in the suburban areas. Uh, uh, we have uh, gangs and violence and things like that, and they've been very effective. Uh, uh, when they've gone into the schools. So it, it's, a, it's a great idea. And do you, you know, taking that a little further, do you see where organizations like the Garibaldi Inns of Court or the New Jersey State Bar Association can play a civic role alongside, you know, other institutes, other academic platforms that focus on mediation not just from the angle of the conflict, but even from the angle of through education and community outreach before it gets to the conflict? Well, uh, th th there's no question that uh, both the uh, Garibaldi Inn and the New Jersey State Bar Association has a dispute resolution section, uh, have been very active and concerned. And one of the missions of both organizations is to aid the community uh, with the techniques that uh, we've all learned and practiced. So um, uh, uh, that and, uh, for instance, in New York, they have these uh, community centers, mediation centers. California has the same, and other states do as well, that are mature. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania has them as well, uh, that um, uh, reach out to the community, and their, their goal uh, is to deal with those kinds of those kinds of issues. We also have in New Jersey a municipal court. We have 520 or 30 municipal courts throughout our state, that many municipalities, and we have a municipal court mediation volunteer mediation program uh, 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 to help people with neighborhood dis uh, disputes. You know, low-level, uh, quasi-criminal uh, kinds of uh, kinds of matters to keep those out of the court and allow the neighbors to figure out how to work out their issues. Well, it sounds though this, these community mediation centers that you're referring to in some other states, do we have anything like that framework currently here in New Jersey? What, what we've done, it's come through the court system. The, the closest that we have uh, our use of the organizations in reaching out, for instance, to the schools and all, and, and the municipal court mediation system that the court created um, uh, that uh, is at the uh, lower level of the community, lower level meaning lower um, uh, intensity kinds of uh, issues, uh, neighborhood kinds of issues. Well, it'd be interesting to explore that uh, and maybe some of our audience uh, can share insight as well uh, through their own perspectives around the world. Um, 
because I think uh, this is a great, great sort of perspective of how community mediation centers, separate from the courts, can play an active civic and academic role in participation. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about the international perspective of New Jersey. What is New Jersey doing on the global stage that, you know, is uh, helpful for really, we'll say, the business community in trying to assist, especially in the climate we're in now, where we're, we're all trying to find ways to, to preserve our, our economies and, and try to grow our economies. And certainly New Jersey would like to continue to explore its uh, and export its, uh, its state as a place to do business and to have its businesses be able to come here and, and set up uh, distribution systems to access the United States economy. One of the exciting things that I've had the opportunity to do is to deal with you and your New Jersey City University's IDR in creating legislation in New Jersey, the International <clears throat> uh, Arbitration uh, uh, Mediation and Conciliation Act, uh, which allows a, the enforcement of a mediated settlement through arbitration, because arbitration is enforceable under something called the New York Convention in 163 or so countries around the world. And uh, we have set up <coughs> uh, the uh, Global Mediation Exchange Center, uh, which will allow businesses in New Jersey, now that there's international trade at the level it is, uh, uh, businesses in New Jersey that aren't big businesses to affordably enforce their uh, uh, the agreements that are resolved in uh, mediation and or arbitration. So it's really uh, the, uh, the UN has worked on this. There's something called the Singapore Convention. It's in the process, uh, but it'll take a long time to be ratified. New Jersey now has this vehicle. So an American company and a foreign company uh, if you're one of the 163 or so under the uh, New York Convention, uh, can actually take advantage of this. And uh, it, it uh, I think, is going to be a strong um, uh, uh, platform uh, uh, to uh, advance business interests throughout the United States. Well, I think that's a great way to, to leave our discussion today and, and that something you you set forth, which is, mediation and business are a partnership together. And if you look at it from the perspective of disputes that are commercial or cross-border or even localized uh, from our conversation and the things you've sort of educated our audience, audience on today, it sounds like uh, mediation is something that should be uh, further explored. All for it, David. And I, I, I want uh, to, uh, suggest that uh, you're bringing forth to our legal community this confluence of business and uh, law in mediation has been uh, really a success and very helpful. It's uh, innovation involves a big village of many stakeholders and uh, our students, our community, our judiciary, our state, as well as all the professionals like you that embrace uh, this idea and the, uh, and the values behind what mediation stands for, which is self-determination and abilities for people to come together uh, to resolve with the help of a third party neutral, but still taking a very proactive role in resolving their conflicts. Uh, I see this as a very humanistic approach to humanity in general. And I wanna thank you for being part of our discussion today. My pleasure, always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So once again, this is uh, Professor David Weiss speaking on behalf of Connecting Bridges and Borders, our seminal Spotify and podcast program from the Institute for, Dis for Dispute Resolution at New Jersey City University. And as always, until the next time, I bid adieu.